Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, welcome, everybody, to, to this tutorial, to this new iTrain session. I want to copy in the chat a couple of links that can be quite useful for you to just to follow my presentation and to have access to, to the tools that we will use later. I hope you can see them in, in the chat. And then we can now start with with the talk itself. So I hope you can see my, my presentation in, in full mode. And as Stephanie mentioned, my name is Alvaro. I'm based at the University of Cologne in Germany, which is part of the German Alma Arc node. And as such, so we are happy providing support and developing new tools to, to the Alma community, which can hopefully be useful when dealing with and scientific analysis of, of data obtained with ALMA and even with other interferometers. And in today's session, so what I would like to present is this software that we developed a couple of years ago, and it's called StatQuant. And we will see a little bit what you can do with, with that. The way I have divided this, this session is in two parts. First, we will have uh, about half an hour with less talk about introducing what is StatQuant, so the basic uh, information about this. And then we will have another half an hour, more or less, to do a live demo tutorial in which we will learn how to install StatCon, how to use it, and we will run some test cases, some examples. In order to do this, so you have the links that I have posted in the chat. So the first link was the presentation, so you can follow essentially what, what I'm saying here. And then the other two links is the GitHub repository where StatCon is located, and the test cases that we will run in the live demo tutorial. So going ahead with this introduction, we can start with this uh, for first question, who is a StatCon? So StatCon is essentially a package that was developed by a group of people, in particular so myself, uh, Peter Schilke, Adam Ginsburg, Ricardo Ciceroni, and Annika Schmidike. And the results of this development resulted in this publication that you can see uh, cited here. And if you want to, to have a little bit more information, details on what StatCon is doing, so please check this reference. So I cannot cover all the things in this talk, just to keep it a bit short, but feel free to go for, to the paper for more details or feel free to contact me if there is something that needs clarification or some new ideas that you think could be beneficial. So we have answered who. We can then go to the next question, where? So where is the StatCon? So StatCon, it's everywhere, it's in internet. So essentially, if you go to Google or any other uh, search uh, tool in, in internet and you type StatCon, I think it should be relatively easy that you end finding the, the two main web pages where you can find all the information related to StatCon. So here I have listed both of them. The first one is the GitHub repository page where you can uh, have access to the latest version of a StatCon. This is installed or available within this uh, web page, uh, Radio Astro Tools, that I think many of you probably have been using if you are doing radio astronomy research. So there are some tools, a Spectral Cube or PV Extractor, that are commonly and quite popular among many radio astronomers. So StatCon is another tool that you can find in this repository. There is also this home page. Uh, where you can find a little bit more information of this uh, stat code. It's a little bit outdated right now. I'm sorry for that. But if you always want to go to the latest release of StatCon, please go to the GitHub uh, webpage. So we have seen who and where. Next question is why. So why do we need StatCon? So StatCon, the, the main goal is to get the continuum level of your observations. And you may wonder why do we care about the continuum level? So the continuum emission when you are doing a ceramic information contains quite useful information of the object that you're studying. So you can derive many important physical properties from them, maybe not all of them. For the others, you probably need information from spectral lines, but the continuum emission can give you an idea of the spatial structure of the source or the mass or the density, you key information of the sources or the object that you are studying. And also, whenever you are able to determine this continuum level, you will end knowing better what is the resulting emission, that it's not continuum, that it's basically line content, spectral line features. So you will be able to better determine or characterize the spectral line content 
uh, of your astronomical source. So, okay, this has been done in the past quite regularly, distinguishing continuum from spectral lines. Why do we need a new tool? So in the past, it was relatively easy to determine where was the continuum emission based on an observation. Here you have an example. The x-axis is the frequency in gigahertz from about 220 to 22 gigahertz. So it's just an astronomical source. And you can see that there are along this uh, range of this electromagnetic spectrum, there are many parts in which there is almost no emission or emission of continuum. And then suddenly there are some lines, some spectral lines. And you can see that these spectral lines are well identified and well located in a specific ranges or frequencies of your observation. So determining the continuum was quite easy because you could just select those ranges that had no line emission, the ones that I'm highlighting with my cursor, and then you could get, you could get the continuum quite easily from, from this one. Nowadays, with telescopes like ALMA and other facilities that provide you with a very high sensitivity observation of your object, most of the sources do not look like this, but they can end looking in something like this one. So here I'm just showing one pixel of one ALMA map. And I'm just, so this was a large observation over many frequency ranges. And we could zoom in a little bit and zoom in a bit more. And you can see that here, what we have is many, many lines. So we are quite sensitive now. So what before was pretty thought that was continuum level, once you have enough sensitivity, you can start resolving many, many spectral line features. And if you go to this spectrum and you try to identify which ranges correspond to just continuum, it's, it's not impossible, but let's say that it takes a little bit of time and it's quite tedious. So in, in this zoom in here, maybe one could think that a couple of channels here would be associated with continuum emission. Maybe another couple of channels here would be continuum emission. So if you have to go through this long spectrum and just find which channels are the good ones, it can take quite a bit of time. Another aspect of why new tools maybe were necessary is the fact that being more sensitive allows you to detect more sources in your a portion of the sky that you're observing, your field of view. And this may result in detecting, for example, three sources, like in this case here, we have a green, a red, and a blue one. And in particular, these red and blue ones have different velocities compared to the green one. Let's say that one is red shifted, the other is blue shifted. So if the three sources would have similar spectral features, but they have different velocities, what could happen is the following. You would try to determine which channels are free from, con from line emissions, essentially containing only continuum in this image. And you would take, for example, a spectrum of this object here, and you would try to see, okay, let's count which channels could be just continuum. Maybe you're lucky and you identify some of them that look promising and you would say, fine. So this portion of the spectrum should be fine to, this, to, to determine the continuum. The problem is that if you have some other objects that have different velocities, one is red shifted, the other is blue shifted. They have the same spectral line content, but they are slightly shifted in velocity just because they have different internal velocities. In that case, the ranges that you have identified as good channels for the continuum of this source do not work well for the other sources. So essentially the channels that you could identify as continuum for one part of, of your map may not work well for other parts of your map. Having this in mind, we thought that we needed uh, something a little bit more, uh, let's say, new or sophisticated, if this is the word, to, to deal with this uh, amount of data that we were getting nowadays with telescopes such as ALMA. So last question is, what is a StatCon? So StatCon is essentially an automatic continuum level determination method. And the idea is that we don't want you to spend time searching for these uh, line-free channels, but we want a software package to do it automatically. It's important to notice that the StatCon is not the only method that it's available. In the last year, so many people have been working on, on the same problem. I guess we all we have, have faced the same difficulties and then we try to come with some ideas to solve them. So in this session, I'm talking about StatCon, but there are some others, for example, Lumberjack that has been developed by Adam Edison. You can find it also here in this GitHub repository, 
or find cont, which probably many of you have been using without maybe realizing, because this is a CASA task that it's contained in the CASA pipeline as this hif underscore find cont that has been developed by Todd Hunter and Crystal Brogan. There are a few more in the literature. What it's important to notice is that all these methods we have converged essentially to the same approach. So all of us, we are doing a very similar um, methodology to try to determine the continuum level, which is very good because this says that we are quite robust with our results. And this means that no matter which software you, you prefer to use, you will end getting very similar results. So if you prefer using this uh, find cont within the CASA pipeline, feel free to use it. If you prefer more this lumberjack approach, go ahead and use it. If you like StatCon, go ahead and use it. So all of them will give you very similar results. They have a little bit of difference one to the other, and they can represent a small difference in very extreme cases where maybe one software works or performs better than another software. But in general, I would say 95, 97% of the cases, all three and even more in the literature will give you very consistent results. So let's go now a little bit more in the detail of uh, what is a StatCon uh, doing in, in more detail. And as I was saying, so StatCon is automatizing the determination of this continuum level. So trying to avoid this manual search for line free channels and having in mind that we may need to, to determine the continuum level in a pixel by pixel basis in a map if you have uh, multiple objects at different velocities, for example. So having this, this in mind, so we thought that maybe we could implement some statistical measures to try to determine this continuum level. And I try to explain this a little bit in more detail. Let's assume that we have this spectrum here. This is a synthetic spectrum that so has been created theoretically. And the important thing is that since it's theoretically, we know that the continuum level has been set to be 50 Kelvin in this case. And we have some emission lines and some absorption lines. So by I, we could easily say, okay, the continuum level is here at 50, everything fine. How to do it in a blind way? So a computer, how could determine this? We thought that creating a histogram of the intensities of all the channels could help. And here you have this histogram of, of intensities. And what it's interesting is that most of the channels seem to have an intensity that it's very close to this 50 Kelvin. This is just because we have many, many channels that are at this uh, level of 50. There are some channels that have higher temperatures because they are emission lines. Some of them have lower temperatures because they're absorption features. We said that this could be promising. So what we did is we created a couple more synthetic spectra cases. This is another source, again, with 50, continuum, uh, 50 Kelvin continuum level with just a few lines. And this is a more crazy spectrum with the level again at 50 Kelvin, but with many absorption features. You can see that the uh, distribution of the intensities, all of them have a peak that it's very close to 50. And depending if your spectrum is emission dominated or absorption dominated, this distribution will be skewed in different directions. So this is quite promising uh, to, to try to use it to, to determine this continuum level. Here, what I'm just doing is zooming in into these parts of the spectrum and into the peak of the histogram. And what we started doing is trying to that to apply different uh, statistical measures to see which one was providing a value that was closer to the 50, 50 Kelvin that we know that it's the real continuum. So one could say to take the, this histogram and search where is the peak, the maximum of the histogram, read out this value in the x-axis, and then we can see how this value corresponds to this uh, in, in the spectrum. And you can see that in some cases, it's a bit far from 50 Kelvin, but in some cases, it's pretty close by. And here in the top, you see what is the continuum level that you would determine if you could pick the maximum of this histogram. So if instead of the maximum, you pick the mean of the distribution, you can see that the values differ a little bit. Maybe they get worse. You could try the median, for example. You could try to do something a little bit more sophisticated and fit a Gaussian to the peak of the distribution. And then you would get these other levels. Or you could say, I don't like uh, boxy histograms, but I prefer applying a KDE. And this is what you see here in this green line. And then determine where is the peak of the KDE. And you could then determine what is the continuum level. 
you could apply different methods like sigma clipping, which essentially is trying to get rid of outliers, either very strong outliers or very weak outliers and trying to converge to the, to the middle point. Or you could even apply something that we call corrected sigma clipping, that it's what it's implemented in StatCon. So there are different methods. Here I summarize this one that I was showing for these three synthetic spectrum cases. The continuum level for all of them was 50 Kelvin. And what we can see is that they are not that far away. And this corrected sigma clipping was quite OK. So it had a little bit of offset in some cases, but it was pretty close to 50 Kelvin. Of course, three cases is just three. It's not a lot. So what we did is we increased the, the sample of synthetic spectra. We created about 1,000 objects. All of them, we fixed the continuum at 50 Kelvin. And then we started to see how the methods uh, worked in, in these 1,000 cases. What you see here is the distribution of continuum levels that we determined. So remember, the real continuum is at 50 Kelvin. So what we would like is that for every one of these 1,000 spectra, the continuum level that we determine is at 50. We can see that we, if we apply this mean of the histogram that we were seeing before, so many cases are close to this 50, so they are well uh, reproduced. But there are a number of objects in which we would overestimate or underestimate clearly the continuum level. So we applied this approach, this study for all the different methods that we studied. And what we searched for is those methods that had most of the objects very close to the value of 50 Kelvin and almost no outliers outside. And we identified a few of them, for example, the maximum or fitting a Gaussian to the peak or the sigma clipping methods seem to be the, the best approaches to, to get the continuum level. A different way to, to evaluate this, uh, how good or these different methods are doing is to measure what is the discrepancy or the difference between the real continuum level and the one that we estimate. So let's take again the example of the mean, calculating the mean of the distribution. And we have this plot here. You can forget about the y-axis. This is just to spread a little bit the points in the vertical direction. And the key information is the x-axis here, that it's the discrepancy or the difference in percentage between the estimated and the real continuum. This means that if we have a very small discrepancy or difference, this means that we have a high accuracy. So in this case, the difference would be less than 5% if we include the green and the red dots. But if we have a very large discrepancy, this means that we have a very low accuracy. And these gray dots are essentially those cases in which this method, mean, was not able to determine the, the continuum well enough. So the, the difference was 10%, 20%, even some cases, 100%, and so on. So for the 1,000 cases that we ran, in, in this case, so 22% were quite good, 64% were quite bad. So this already told us that the mean is probably not a good strategy, but we did the same thing for all the different methods. And the idea is to find out which ones, which method almost has no points here colored in gray and has most of the points in the green and red region. And we found out that this corrected sigma clipping works quite well. In 90% of the cases, the difference between estimated and real continuum was less than 5%, which was quite good. And only 5 6% of the cases had very bad estimates. So this, this told us that methods like this, sigma clipping or corrected sigma clipping, were quite good to determine the continuum level in many sources. Just to tell you, so the other methods that I was mentioning, the find count or the uh, lumberjack, they essentially also use sigma clipping method to determine the continuum level. So it was very good to see that different groups with different approaches uh, disconnected in the beginning one from the other, we all reach the, the same conclusion. Why do we need to correct? So why in StatCon we are applying this correction? I can show you one example and, and then you can see it more clear. So this is a very complex and nasty case. So it's it's horrible case to deal with, but we wanted to, to push a little bit the software to, to the edges to see when it could fail. This is, again, a spectrum in which the continuum level is 50 Kelvin. We have many absorption features, 
and we have noise added into it. So it's quite a noisy spectrum with many absorption features. From the spectrum alone, if you would have to determine that the level is 50 Kelvin, you probably would not say that. And indeed, if you apply sigma clipping normally, you would get something like 27 Kelvin, so almost half the real continuum level. So what we tried to do is we implemented some heuristics inside StatCon that try to evaluate if the spectrum that you are dealing with is mainly absorption dominated or emission dominated, and then tries to apply a correction on top of the sigma clipping method. I don't go into the details, so you can find them in the publication and you can also contact me if you want to, to know a bit more, but I can show you what is the effect of this correction. So here we have the, the data for these 1000 cases that I was mentioning before. Again, you can forget about the y axis. This is just to spread the points vertically. The important thing is the x axis, that it's the continuum level that was determined from the sigma clipping method. So ideally, all the gray dots should be aligned into this 50 Kelvin uh, vertical position, that it's where all, so the, the continuum, the real continuum level for all these sources, but we can see that they diverge a little bit. After applying this correction, we have these dots here. I can go back and forth a couple of times. And what we see is that most of the points tend to align a bit better into this 50 Kelvin level, uh, suggesting that this correction is working quite well in most of the cases. Of course, there are situations like these ones here or these ones here. These are extreme cases in which either the spectrum is really noisy or it's extremely dominated yes, by emission, spectral line features, emission or absorption, and then the continuum level cannot really be determined. So in order to get the continuum of this kind of extreme regions, you probably would need to have an underlying physical model to, to model both at the same time continuum and lines in order to get uh, the good continuum level. So, can StatCon be applied to real data or are you already just running it on synthetic data? So we have applied to real data and I show you a couple of examples. So this is a star forming region in which we have a number of objects. So the left panel in the top is a continuum determined with StatCon and the right panel here is a continuum that you would determine if you spent a little bit of time searching for line free channels. I can tell you that doing the one on the right took a bit longer because I had to go manually searching for these channels. And it seems even a little bit noisier than the one that StatCon is producing. The other thing that it's interesting is that the StatCon produces some kind of noise or error of the continuum determination. And then you can use it as a, a value or a measure of how accurate the, the continuum has been determined. So what is the error of the continuum that you have determined? And here you can see just yes, the ratio of the corrected sigma clipping or StatCon method to the classic uh, continuum method. If you take these two positions A and B, so yes, you can extract the spectrum and you can see how the data looked like. And this is spectra after having subtracted the continuum. And you can see that more as the continuum fits quite well with what you could draw by I at zero, in this case, milligenses per beam level. Another source is this one here, say Teres V2, which it's pretty more interesting to, to explore because here by I, you can already see that the continuum determined from a statcon and the one determined uh, classically are quite different in this, not quite, quite different, but you can see that in this classical method, we have this kind of a spherical bubble that it's not visible here. And the reason is that the continuum channels, uh, or the channels that were determined to, to calculate the continuum manually, um, were extracted from some positions in this map, but did not include information on this outer part. And this outer part is uh, highly dominated by molecular line emission that has this bubble shape, and it's only present in some molecules. So if you are not careful enough to determine these continuum ranges, you could create a continuum map in the classical method that it's wrong because all this uh, bubble-like feature here is not really continuum, but it's just contribution from some molecules. So in this case, the StatCon dealt, uh, dealt a little bit better with the data that we had, and then we could better determine the structure of, of the dust continuum emission in this case. And again, these positions A and B 
show the spectra at two different locations. And in this case, you can see that one location was highly dominated by uh, emission features. The other one was highly dominated by absorption features. And in both cases, the continuum level seems to be quite well at zero after having subtracted the continuum emission. Uh, I was quite happy that in the last year, some groups have been also using StatCon in their analysis, which I think it's, it's interesting to, to know. Yes, so they have found it a good tool to, to work the, uh, with their data. I found a bit more than 30 publications and these publications uh, cover different ranges. So there are some studies like the Alchemy program in which they study extragalactic sources. There are some other projects in which they do uh, astrochemical studies. And there are some other studies uh, focused on low mass or high mass air formation. So I think if, if at some point you want to, to separate continuum from lines, feel free to consider StatCont as a tool to do it. Remember that there are other tools, so find Kant in the CASA pipeline, Lumberjack, and some others in the literature. With this, I could finish my introduction and we can see if there are some questions. So feel free to, to raise your hand or type it in, in the chat and then we can, we can answer. So it's, okay, I see that some, okay, yeah, I see that there is some question and uh, it says, uh, has there been a systematic comparison of these three tools? And if so, where can we find such a comparison? Sorry if I missed that. That's a very good point. So these three tools, I'm guessing it refers to StatCon, Lumberjack, and FindCon. I would say there has no, there is no probably published comparison of these three tools, but we have been doing some work together. So uh, Crystal, Todd, uh, Adam, and myself, we ran some ALMA data and we found out, so we tested for a few sources, um, I don't know, five or, or 10. And we found that the results were very, very comparable. So you, the continuum level was essentially the same just with a few percent difference between one tool and the other. So it was within the errors. And I think it depends which tool you want to use. It probably depends on uh, what is your scientific case or for what you want to do it. So if, if you have data that it's already uh, ALMA data and you have the disabilities and so on, and you have everything running in, in the pipeline or in the imaging, so probably it's easier for you if you use this uh, Hive uh, underscore find con task within CASA, and then you, you get directly the continuum. In the case that your source is a little bit more complicated and you have maybe multiple uh, objects in your field of view, then things like Lumberjack or StatCon may work better. One thing that the StatCon is doing is that it's a benefit and a deficit in some sense. So we are not dealing with the visibilities. So we are just dealing with the spectra or, or the image. So if you would have just data that some colleague has sent you or or from some old observation in which you cannot recover the visibilities or the visibilities, you cannot convert them into CASA format or it's quite challenging. So if you would have the, the FITS file or an ASCII file with the spectrum, then you can immediately apply a StatCon to it. So you don't need the visibility. So it's, it's a benefit in the sense that you don't need this other information, but then we lack some of the capabilities that you could implement if you would have access to the visibility. So I, uh, in case the, the answer is not, the question is not answered, feel free to, to write another comment and I try to go more in detail. I see that there is a, another um, question that it reads, uh, maybe you mentioned it, but is there minimum number of channels you need to have StatCon working well? This is a very good uh, point. And let me go back to one of these uh, plots in which, I did not mention the, the y-axis, so this you, in the publication, you, you can find it, but this y-axis, let me go yes, to this point here. So it's essentially the percentage of channels that would have a good um, or a flux intensity that it's consistent with the continuum, the, the real continuum of, of these synthetic cases. And you can see that once you have something like 35, 40% of channels that are 
uh, just reproducing the continuum emission, so essentially not contaminated by lines, you will always be determining the continuum level with a very high accuracy, better than, so differences of less than 10 or 5%, that's quite good. In this case, so with the mean, you can see that if you have 20, 10 or 5% of the channels with the emission of the continuum only, then it seems that you will never be able to, to get this uh, continuum level correct. This was with the mean. This is why if, if you explore other cases, you can see that the last one here, the one that we used, so the y-axis is always the same, so from zero to about 60%. Uh, you can see that with the stat count, there are cases in which if you have about five, 10% of the channels reproducing the continuum, only those channels reproducing the continuum, stat count seems to be able to get the continuum. Of course, there are some cases you can see here that do not work. But based on this diagram, one could try to draw a line here. And one could say that if you have 10% of your channels, uh, more or less at the intensity level of your continuum emission, you should be able to determine it correctly. If you have less than 10% of the channels, you will have some cases in which you can determine it well, but there will be some weird cases in which it can fail. And these weird cases are the ones that were shown here. So these outlayers here, in which the spectra may look something like this one here, in which there are almost no channels that are really at the continuum level, so no matter which method you use, so it's really hard to, to get the continuum level. But usually, so I would say that if you have something like 5% of your channels are close to the continuum level, StatCon should work well. If you have less than 5%, in many cases, it will work also well. But one has to be always a bit careful that, um, yeah, with, with the results that you get if you have a very complex uh, source. Again, so in case this question was uh, not answered, it's still open, so feel free to write another message and I'm happy to, to answer. Okay. Um, Alvaro, sorry, there are yeah. some questions on the chat. Okay, I see, I, I, can, I can see them. Okay, thank you, uh, I, I can go through them. So um, there's one that reads, uh, hi Alvaro and panelists, Thanks for the fantastic training. If I remember correctly, there was a major improvement done uh, to high fine count in the newer ALMA pipeline. Uh, so perhaps it's good to mention this aspect that if they want to use a high fine con CASA, they should use a more recent version of the CASA and the pipeline. Fully agree with that. So indeed, when working with an ALMA a project, so in particular ALMAGAL, so it's a large program, in which uh, Crystal and Todd are involved, we realized that uh, the high fine count task as it was implemented in previous releases of CASA was doing a good job, but in regions in, that are very chemically rich or with multiple sources in the same field of view, it could fail uh, a bit. And then, so by testing a little bit with this uh, data from this program, Almaga, they managed to, to make improvements into the fine con task, and now it works quite well. So it takes a little bit longer to run, but not much more, but then the results are, are more accurate, I would say. So yes, as it was mentioned in the chat, if you want to use fine con, always try to use the newest versions of CASA and the pipeline, and this in particular, so if you use CASA 6.1, 6.2 at this moment, this should be working uh, well, the new version of, of uh, the fine count in CASA. Mm. I see some other questions. I don't know if they are, I'm reading. Okay. And then, okay, so I see another question. I think for Alma, the nominal flux accuracy is 5, 20% pending on the bands. Would you advise to add a conservative 5% uncertainty after a stat count? Uh, do you mean in this, uh, I don't know if the question refers to, to this error, so to the error that, that you get in the end, 
but for sure. So a stat count is not really um, taking into account errors that exist in the calibration. But I don't know if you want to add something to the question. I see that you unmute it. So yeah, the question is um, more general because uh, you, you did a benchmark uh, and a test on different cases and then you find like this 5% uh, uh, uncertainty or so just to be conservative in case you want to get very uh, high accuracy flux measurements. Is yeah. it a good, uh, a good way to do this? Or? Yeah, so if, if you, so if you want to get a very accurate uh, flux measurement, um, so if your calibration has not worked well or the flux accuracy that you have is 10% or 20%, you will end having this, this error. And then, so the final uh, continuum level that you determine so will also be inaccurate uh, to this, to this uh, level or to this uh, percentage. So these methods, unfortunately, cannot deal with improving the, let's call it systematic errors introduced by calibration. So one has to be always careful. So when getting any result from the continuum, so either StatCon, Lumberjack, FineCon, any other method, be always careful with what you are getting. So be critical with your own results and try to to have in mind that there can be other effects that can produce, introduce additional um, uncertainties in, into your measurement. I see a different question in, in the q and It reads, uh, which tool is best for varying resolution spectral cubes? Huh. <laughs> um, so, in StatCount, this is a benefit and a deficit at the same time. In StatCount, it's working pixel by pixel. So we do not care about different spectral resolution in the channels of the cube. So it will go and yeah, it will, it will take every pixel and then we'll process independently. The problem of course, is that we know that in these maps that we get, the pixels are not independent. So they, they are correlated by the beam. And this is something that it, it, it's a future uh, item to be implemented into StatCon. So how to deal with this correlation between pixels. And this will also probably be connected to how to deal with cubes that have um, different or varying uh, angular resolution in the channels. My first approach would be if you can, try to convolve to the same common bin uh, for all the channels. Uh, and then this, this would work fine. Of course, if you want to keep the native uh, resolution for every channel, one has to be, a, yeah, one has to be a bit more critical than with the results that, that you get. So if you have a relatively well-behaved and well-behaved could be something like uh, this case here in which there are some channels that more or less fit in the continuum. I would say that even if you have varying uh, resolution in the channels, you will get a good continuum representation. However, you will have to take into account that uh, there is this additional error in, in, in the beam convolution, let's say, uh, to, to the final flux that you are measuring. So in short, StatCon is not dealing with different beam beams in, in the spectral cube. I recommend to convolve to common beam. I don't remember if Lumberjack is dealing with that. Uh, FineCon, for example. So Lumberjack and FineCon, what they do is they, they follow a similar approach, but then they identify, FineCon in particular, they identify the channels that correspond to the line-free channels, and then they distinguish or separate the visibilities into line and continuum. And then by doing this into the visibility domain, it's easier to, to deal with the changing uh, uh, resolution in, in your cube. Essentially, you don't care anymore because once you have the channels, you remove the continuum and then you produce just your continuum with one single beam. So for the moment, StatCon, I would say convolve to, to the same common beam. If you cannot, we can have a look and then we can see 
if we could implement or how much the error could be. Let's see, I see some other question. So for, for the previous question and this one, so in case there are still things um, not fully answered, feel free to, to ask again or, or to clarify. Uh, I see uh, one question says, ah, wait, they are moving in my monitor, okay. In slide 14, okay, is this one, but since I have 14 in many slides, let's see, is this one here, okay. Uh, if the signal increases, why the error uh, increases, or what is the noise for you? Okay, yeah, that's a very good point. So here, the, the error, the, the way, this noise, let's say, that you can get from a stat count is just a measure of the um, dispersion that you get after applying the sigma clipping. So let's take this spectrum B as an example. If you start applying sigma clipping, what will happen is that you will start removing the outliers, in this case, the ones that correspond to the bright emission, and then you will compute against the mean, and then you will check all the points that are maybe two sigma apart from your mean, they will be considered outliers and they will be excluded and so on. So iteratively, you will be excluding those points that are above or below two sigma with respect to the mean that you are calculating. In the end, what you will remain is with some uh, channels or some points in which the values are consistent with the mean plus minus two sigma or one sigma. So depending which parameter you define. So in StatCon is defined as 1.7 uh, sigma. So this 1.7 sigma is essentially what we consider in StatCon as the error of your, of, of your continuum determination. And the thing is that this is th the fact that there is more noise in this part than in the outside is connected more to the fact that you have more channels here that are lines, spectral lines, and they have been excluded from this sigma clipping. And then what you remain is with less and less and less channels. And therefore the dispersion that you get, it's a little bit larger. So essentially it's a combination of uh, those positions in which, in which you have lines, they will usually be always um, less well-determined. So if you would have no line at all, so it would be perfect uh, continuum, no problem. If you have lines, you are excluding some channels and then the noise that you are getting in the end, it's getting larger because you are getting rid of channels, you're getting rid of data. And then it's, yeah, so the dispersion ends being a little bit larger. I don't know if this uh, answers the question again, so I'm happy to try to clarify it better if necessary. So for the moment, I don't see more questions. So at any time you can, you can ask and you can type more things. We could maybe move into the, this live demo tutorial. Uh, so I will go out of the full screen mode. And so we would continue now with this part here. And for this, I will just use this the PDF that you have available and that I will also copy in the chat in case some people arrived later. So I just copy this message that I will paste in the chat and then everyone should have access now to the, to the presentation that I was giving and to the GitHub repository and to the test cases. My intention now was to to try to go step by step, what you would need to do if you want to download uh, StatCon and how to run it. And I will be downloading it and making, so installing it at the same time. So I hope you can see well the terminal. If it's too small, the, the text, so let me know and I can make it a bit larger. And what we do is so we can go to this other slide in the presentation and that tells us how to access and how to download and install StatCon. So to access the StatCon, you will need to, to go to the GitHub page. So it's the second link that I have posted in, in the chat. I have opened it here. So it's this one here, it's the GitHub repository. You have a little bit of text, an explanation. 
and you have some installation instructions. Okay, let me go back to the presentation. So once we have located this, this link, so you could go to the chat and just click the second link and hopefully it opens fine in, in your browser. And then we could try to, let's say, download and install it. So what I will do is I will create, so this is my a terminal in my laptop, the one that I'm using to, to give this talk. I will create just a, let's call it, yeah, so a directory that it's empty. I don't have any statcon. I have a statcon, I should remove. <laughs> Let me think that I'm cheating. So now I don't have any statcon in my computer. So we could take it as if it would be your own case. And what we need to do is you could go into your computer, you could search a directory where you want to install statcon. And there are different ways to install it. So my suggestion is just to clone the GitHub repository and then just execute the, the normal packages. You would do it with many of the AstroPy packages. So StatCon has a full, um, it's let's say compatible with uh, AstroPy ecosystem. So you, you can do the same things that you can do with any AstroPy package. You should be able to do it with StatCon. So we are in this directory that again, it has nothing. I initiate my Git repository and then I can git clone. I'm just typing to show you that I'm not doing or copying anything that it's strange. And I know that I did a mistake. I just retools. Let's make it a bit bigger. So if you clone it, so it should connect. So if you have internet, which you should have because you are listening to me. So you, you clone the repository. And now if we do an LS, you should have this folder called statcont. So we can go inside. So cd statcont. And here you will see the different uh, files that correspond to the AstroPy ecosystem and the packages. So that if you would go to this other statcont directory, you have the different uh, Python scripts that uh, define what statcont is doing. So if you want to install it, you can just run Python. I will use Python 3 in my case. So uh, StatCon works well, should work well with uh, 3.5 and above, 3.7 and so on. It should work well also with two, Python 2.7. At least in the past, I was using it. But now I try to, since Python 2 is essentially not existing anymore or it's not being uh, sustained. So I think it's better if all of you go into Python 3. Or, but if you take with Python 2 and you find some problems, I'm happy to try to, to figure out what, what can be happening. So if you type Python 3, setup.py and install, it should start installing. So it initiates all the AstroPy things, and you should have Satcon installed now. That's all. So the only thing that you should do are these, these things here, git init, git clone, go to the directory where the setup file is and then just install it. In case you are doing it uh, now live, so I hope it's working. If it's not working, uh, write something in the chat and we try to, to solve it. So if you have done this, you have, uh, let's say 90% of, of, of the work done. And now, okay, so if you have some problems, I, I usually have found two kinds of problems. One of them is that you are trying to install it in a computer where you don't have permissions, then just make sure that, so you could try to install it as your user. So instead of uh, the command Python setup install, you could add these additional commands to try to, to install it uh, for you in case you don't have uh, admin uh, permissions. And then you can define, so the place where you want to install the scripts, you can then add it to your path, and then it should work fine. Another common problem that I have found is that some of your uh, Python packages may not be the ones that uh, StatCon is using. And I have listed here the packages that uh, I use. And the most critical ones are probably AstroPy, NumPy, and yeah, Matplotlib maybe. So these are the versions that I was testing in the last runs. 
in older versions should also work fine. But what you may encounter sometimes is warnings that maybe one function in one of these packages has changed some variable and maybe it's still working, but in the future it will not work. Or maybe they say this variable is not defined as it is anymore. In that case, so you could either try to upgrade the package that you have, or you could let me know and I could try to add uh, uh, some, something in the code to, to fix this, this issue with the different Python package versions. Okay, so once you have done the, the Python setup install, to know that you have a statcon working, you could just type a statcon help. And now if you get some message that does not crash with any error, this means that the statcon should be working fine. So if you are doing this uh, live, uh, and again, it's not working, let me know that it does not work. If it's working, you can also let me know, and then I'm happy to know that, that it's, it's working fine. Uh, so what you get with this statcon dash dash help is essentially a list of all the parameters that you can, uh, commands or options that you can execute with a statcon. At the beginning, oops, sorry, at the beginning, you will see a short message and you can see what is the version that you're running. So currently it's version 1.5. Uh, so whenever I do some major updates, I, I change the number. So if it's just some type or bug, so I pray it remains the same version. But this can be useful in case you had a previous version of a statcon, so you can then know if, if, if you should uh, update it or not. Okay. So if you have been able to run this help command, yeah, you should see something like this, what we saw before. So all these lists of commands. And there is a long list, don't worry. So you don't need to, to know all of them. In the presentation, I have listed the ones that are the most critical ones or most important ones, let's say. Uh, the first one is this help, that it's the one that we have used that will show you all the list of, of parameters that you can use. There are four other uh, commands that are used to define the input data that you want to process. So we will go in, into this in, in a little moment. Essentially, there are two sets of uh, commands if you are dealing with uh, FITS files, and two sets of files of commands if you are dealing with uh, single spectra that it's maybe stored in a dot uh, that uh, ASCII uh, text file or so. So essentially you can deal with fit files and normal ASCII files, depending on what you want to process. This uh, path command essentially is the subdirectory where the data that you want to process is stored. And essentially statcont wants to have you the data inside a directory called data. You will see it in a moment. And within this directory data, you could put save any kind of subdirectory where you want to store your data. For example, if you have three sources and you want to make sure that the data of every source is in its own directory, what you would need to have is a directory called data and then source one, source two, source three. And then when you define the path, you just need to indicate if you want to process the data stored in the path source one or source two or source three. The other command is noise and this is a necessary command, so you have to indicate it always. And it should be essentially the noise of your data. If you don't know what's the noise or you don't want to calculate it or so, you could just set it to one and it should work relatively okay. If you want to do a little bit more accurate, you can always change this, this command to a different parameter. Otherwise, just always type minus n one and this, this should work fine. Then once you have defined essentially the data that you want to process, you can use the continuum command to determine the continuum level. You can create some plots. You can create some cutouts of your fits. And if you have multiple data, different frequencies, you can even try to compute the spectral index between the continuum of the different files. I hope people can follow if do well what uh, I'm saying. Otherwise, again, so yes interrupt write something in in the chat 
of even of this shorter list of, of commands, most likely the ones that you will be using if you want to run StatCon will be these four. So you only need to know these four. So the name of the file that you want to process, the path, the directory where the file is stored, this noise value, which usually you can just set it to one, and the continuum, just to say that you want to get the continuum. So these are just the normal four commands that you will be using most of the time. Okay, let's go now to, if you have been able to install StatCon, you may want to download some, some data and to do some tests. For this, you could use your own data if you want, but I have uh, created some simple synthetic test cases that can be downloaded from this link. It's the last link in the, in the chat. So I don't know if you can see the chat here, but the last link is the one that contains this star file. So you could click the link in the chat that I think it's copied here. So blah, 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 this case is star, yes. And you can download it. So I will say, save it. And I will save it in this 001, uh, 00i train and directory that I created. StatCon is where the software is stored. So I will just put it outside this as for me to order it. So it should be downloaded. So if I do an LS here, I'm inside StatCon, but if I go outside, I have the StatCon package that I cloned from the Git repository and the tar file that I just downloaded. Okay, so this seems to work fine. Should be quite fast to download this because the file is relatively small. So you can just uh, unzip it and then you have the tar file. You can just untar it. And now you should see this directory called statcon-tests. So if you go inside statcon-tests, you will see that there is this directory data that I was mentioning. So all the data that you want to process should be stored here in data. There are some functionalities in StatCon that get rid of this limitation, but for starting, I would recommend you to, to have it like this. So some folder where you have your StatCon analysis and then the data that you want to process is stored in data. And within data, what we have is three different subdirectories. This is the thing that I was saying before that you could have source one, source two, source three. In this case, there are three cases because one of them, map test, contains a fits file. And the other one, spec tests, contain three uh, ASCII files, so three, uh, five spectra from, from five different sources. And this spindex one, is a directory where you have 30 different ASCII files at different frequencies that could be used to determine the, the spectral index. Um, okay, so I know that we are one hour now. I'm sorry for the delay, but I, I will try to show you the examples at least of, of the ASCII files and the FITS file, and then we can, we can stop there. So let's start with the example of, of the ASCII file. So if you would have a spectrum uh, obtained from either some single dish observation or that a colleague of you have uh, sent you, how could you determine the continuum? So these are the data that are stored in this spec and underscore test folder. And what you find is these five spectra that I have included are essentially these five ones, different cases. So there is one with few lines, one that has emission features, another with absorption, another that it's a mix of emission and absorption, and another one that has really broad lines trying to reproduce more than what you would get in an extragalactic source. So let's, let's see how should we run StatCon to get the continuum level. So I'm in this directory, StatCon test, where the data is stored. And then the thing that we have to run, I just make it a bit smaller go up here. So what we would need to do is StatCon. So StatCon will be available from any location in, in your computer. So no matter in which directory you are, you can always execute the StatCon. You can determine what, what is the path where the spectra are located. And it's this spec test directory within data. Then we can say that the file that we want to use was the one called uh, emission. So let me just open a different that's a different tab to show you again. So what we are doing is using or having a look 
at this emission uh, five. So we want to get the continuum of this spectrum that essentially has this feature or this shape shown here. Then we have to define this noise parameter that we set it to one. So we don't want to think about this continuum at uh, this noise level. And then we just need to say, we want to get the continuum. So we run it and that's all. So what you will get is, so this uh, information here in the terminal and that I replicate here in the PDF. So you have essentially an idea of how much time. So when you started it, when it is estimated to finish and when it really finished. This is because sometimes if you want to process large files, it may take a bit longer and it's just for you to know how much time it may take. Then you get the continuum information. So for this spectrum, the continuum was calculated to be 50.8 plus minus 0 0.9. It's quite good because we know that it should be 50 Kelvin. And then it has created some output files. So one of them, so all the output files are produced in this other folder called products. And it creates the same subfolder for source one, source two, and so on. And then you have a number of information here. So you have the continuum that it's essentially telling you at the frequency of your observation that it's usually taken to be the central one of your spectrum. What is the continuum level? You could get also information of the noise. Again, at the frequency, what is the noise? So these two values, 50.8 and 0 0.93 are these ones here. And then you also get this thing here that it's essentially the spectrum that you originally had, but with the continuum subtracted. So in case you want to do uh, analysis of your data, you have also a, a ASCII file with this line only data. We could use the same, so let me just clear this. So I'm in the same directory. And we could say we want to process not the emission one, but we want to process the absorption spectrum. We just change the name of our file and we have it. And now we get what is the continuum level and the same output files. So for single spectra, as you, you can see, it's, it's relatively fast. So it's just a matter of fractions of a second. You could, you, you may remember from the talk that I was talking about all these statistical methods. So you could just run. So if you don't want the one that it's implemented, you could say, I want to use the maximum of the distribution or the mean of the distribution or the median or the Gaussian or the KDE. So instead of using the command continuum, you could use another one. For example, I want to use the continuum determined with the maximum. Then you execute it and then you would get you will always get what is the continuum that you would get with the official, let's say, estimation, and the one here in this case that you get with, with the maximum. You could say that you want to do it for all of them, all the methods that are implemented in StatCon, and you will get this long message. And here you can see the continuum estimated with all the different methods. And maybe this, this can be useful for you to, to know if, yeah, so if you prefer a different method, so how accurate it would be or not. Um, yeah, I see the question. So does it also give a file with the channel ranges and or frequency ranges for the continuum? That's a good question. And this is something that it's being kind of implemented. It's in this beta version that you have here. There are some hidden commands that allow you to get these uh, continuum ranges. I, I, it's not fully uh, operational yet. This is why it's not available for the normal user, let's say it, but it's kind of implemented. So I will try to, to work on that and to get it uh, work more officially. But if some of you are very interested in getting these continuum ranges, just tell me and then we ca I can tell you how to execute them. Uh, or we can try to speed up the, the way of making it official for everybody. If you want to see plots, what you could do is, so for example, I want to see how the continuum looks like for all the continuum levels. Let me just clear up and yes. So you just take the same command 
in this case, absorption. Uh, yeah, absorption, I have the example I that I will show in the PDF is the mission, but just to show that both of them work fine. So you can execute with plots, it will compute everything. And then if you go to the products section and the spec thing, there is so there are all these different files that are being created for the different methods. And then there is this directory here where you can see the plot that has been produced. We can open it and it looks like this one here. So this contains what is the spectrum that we are trying to fit. You can see that it's it's not well behaved, so it's quite complicated, but this way you can see how how it statcon works in very complex situations. And you can see all the different color lines are essentially the different methods. And you can see here on top, what is the continuum that was determined for the different methods. So you can see that it's, it's, this, it's a really complex situation. The one that they have in the PDF, it's a little bit better behaved situation in which you have just a mission and you would have the the different continuum levels, and then also the horizontal lines. This is just for visualization. Most likely you will, if, if you have to do science, you will probably not care that much about these plots, but if you want to do some quick tests, it can be useful. Uh, let's move now uh, to, to FIT files, because most likely all of you want to work with FIT files and not with uh, yes, ASCII data, how to do it. So, let me just clear up this thing. So here, what we have is uh, in the map test directory, what you have is a synthetic cube fits file. And we could even open this one yes, for you to see that it's really uh, something that it makes sense, let's say. So I have opened DS9. I hope you can see it. I can zoom it a bit. And this is a synthetic cube. And what you can see, so it's a cube in which, so I can change the channels and you will say, however, nothing is changing in the image. Yeah, because it's highly dominated by continuum in some parts, but if I take spectrum here, let's make a small circle and I bring up the window of the spectrum, you can see that if I move this around, not big, sorry for that. If I move it around, you can see that the spectrum is changing a little bit. So it's more or less the same, but the continuum is what is changing. And also the line shape is also changing a bit. So in, here in the bottom, there are some clear absorption features. And when you go towards the top, it seems to be only mainly dominated by emission lines. So it's, it was just a quick test to, to deal with fit files. So I can just close this for the moment being. And here in the PDF, you can see, so this is the synthetic continuum. This is what has been included in the cube that we have seen. And the bottom panels is what the statcon is producing. So you can see that the statcon determined from, at the continuum determined from the statcon, it's quite similar to the continuum of the synthetic cube. And this bottom panel is essentially the ratio of the synthetic one to statcon. And you can see that there are some ranges in which the error is about maybe 2% or 5%. So, but still reasonable having in mind that usually you have errors of 10, 20% in your calibration. So this is, yeah, it's a spectrum towards one position. So how to run it? So we are again, always yes, here in this directory. And then we just need to, again, execute the stat count. We say that our data is stored in this subdirectory called map test. We want to use the synthetic cube. This is the name of the file, the continuum. Again, you can see that I don't care. So I just put uh, one and then the, the noise, sorry. And then we say that we want to compute the continuum. So we execute and it takes some time. So it tells us that started, so started now, it should finish in three minutes, but it's, it will finish a bit faster. So this is always a very conservative estimate, but just to have an idea in case you see something like two days or so. So don't be afraid, but know that it can take a bit long. So I'm, if, if you have to deal with very large files, let me know and, and I can give you some hints of how to, 
to process it. Let's see, so it's, it's running. Uh, there is another function. Yeah, so now it's finished. You see that in the end, what it took is about 35 seconds. So that, that was a very, very uh, conservative estimate. And here in the PDF, you can see that, yeah, this is the output. Um, this, uh, the outputs will be, we don't have the continuum printed in the terminal because what we have is a continuum file. And this is stored in this directory. So we could open it now. I'm opening it, it's opened. And this is a continuum, which may look like normal in the sense that it reproduces relatively well, more or less the, the synthetic continuum. Of course, so with different color scales here, it's more difficult, but this second panel is essentially the one that corresponds to this map. You can see that some parts are less well reproduced. And this is just because there is a combination of absorption lines, emission lines that probably result in less channels uh, being able to, to calculate properly the continuum. And this is why the, the measure is a little bit more noisy. You can get also, you get a fit file that would be the noise. I should have opened a different um, frame, but yeah, so a new DS9. So this is, how the noise that it's calculated in a statcon, it can give you an idea of which parts of the map are less uh, trustable, let's say. And the other thing that you get is a map that it's just a synthetic cube, that it's essentially, so it's opening, it's just the cube that looks pretty similar, but without light and without continuum. Sorry. So only lines. So if I get this circle here, um, let's see. No, this has, I know, sorry, 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 sorry. I opened the wrong one. I opened the cube fits. Okay, that's good. I should open the products, not the original synthetic cube. That's a very good thing. I was wondering why it was looking so similar to the original one, and it's because it was the original one. And this is how the cube looks like if you subtract the continuum. So I little bit out, so I can take region, I can bring up here the spectrum, and now you can see that, so, Check, so the way it was created, so these first channels and also these ones were usually taken to be very close to the continuum. So you, now that I will move around, so all these channels should be close to zero. And this can give you an idea of how well or bad it has worked. And you can see that no matter where you are, so this channel, so the continuum seems to be well behaved. Okay, so this is how to deal with cubes. And I had another part about the spectral index, but since it's already 15 minutes uh, above time. Uh, ah, okay, well, I can say, so yeah, sorry. If you would have, if you have a very large map and, and you, you don't want to process the whole map, you could always define a portion of the map. So for example, in this case, if we run the same thing that we had before to get the to run the continuum of for the cube but we could say focus only on the pixel 25 25 and make a size of the know 10 pixels uh, so a cube that has a, a portion of the map that will be 10 pixels you can just run it and now what it does it's much faster because now you are just focusing on a smaller part of the map and this smaller part of the map is the place where you have produced the continuum or determined the continuum. And you will see here that now it's much smaller. So it's just about 10 pixels in size in case you know that there is only one source in which you want to, the one portion of the map where is emission and you want to get the continuum there, you can forget about the rest and just define the portion of the map that you want to process. So with this, I will stop. So in the talk, there is a part on how to get a spectral index, and there is some explanation of how to do it. 
yes, to show you that using StatCon, you can get, if you have multiple measurements at different frequencies, you can also have an idea of what is the spectral index. And you can even create a spectral index maps if you have multi, again, multiple images at different frequencies. But just for time considerations, probably I don't, I don't run it. So you have here how to do it. It's just a couple of lines. But with this, I, I stop. So this is uh, my last slide. And I'm happy to take some further questions if, if you have it. Otherwise, I let uh, Stephanie say the last words. Seems that there are no further questions. This is on thanks message. So thanks also for attending. And again, so in case you want to feel free to use either StatCon or Lumberjack or directly what it's contained in the CASA pipeline. Uh, so all of them should produce very similar results. If you need help with doing working with some of this kind of analysis, also I'm happy to to be contacted and try to help as much as I can. Yeah, 